Good afternoon, everyone, and hope you're all well. Welcome along to our second webinar um, for the Greater Cambridge Local Plan First Proposals. Um, it's lovely to have you all here, and thank you for joining. Welcome back those who have been at these sessions before, um, and welcome to those of you who are new and haven't been to the sessions before. We've got an hour-long session today, um, which is on our jobs and homes. Um, what I'll do is I'll introduce you. We've got a panel here, here this morning to help answer some questions. We're going to do a few slides, talk a little bit about um, jobs and homes, do a couple of interactive sessions as well, and then leave some time for questions at the end. Um, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A as we go through the, the, the webinar, because um, our panel will do our best to answer as many questions as possible during the, during the presentations as well. Um, what I'm going to do quickly first is I'm going to unshare my screen. I'm going to introduce you to the panel um, and they can introduce themselves. So without further ado, I'm going to come to Stuart. Hi, my name is Stuart Morris. I'm a Principal Policy Planner um, at Greater Cambridge Share Planning. Good morning, Stuart. Nice to have you. Um, John. Hello, I'm John Dixon. I'm the Planning Policy Manager. Hey, John. Caroline. Good morning. I'm Caroline Hunt. I'm Strategy and Economy Manager. Hey, Caroline. And Stephen. Good afternoon. Uh, Stephen Kelly, Joint Director of Planning. And lastly, but not least, Matt. Thanks, uh, Matt King and e Economics Director at Consultancy, our senior projects been supporting on uh, evidence base. Thanks, Matt, and thanks for joining us. Um, and just a couple from me. So we've also got Will Smith and, and Tim Cliff in the background here running all of the tech this morning. So, so you know, do my big thanks to them because without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. Um, my name's Paul Frayner. Um, I am the Assistant Director for Strategy and Economy um, in the Greater Cambridge Share Planning Service. So quickly, I'm just going to give a bit of an outline of the session and then I'm going to hand over to Caroline, who's going to start walking you through the first slides. So here we go, and I hope that you can all see my screen again. So we have got um, a, a fairly comprehensive, we hope, session for you. We're going to talk a little bit about why we need to plan for development, a little bit about modelling, as I said, we will have a bit of a couple of interactive sessions, so to try and get you involved in, in, in the, your thoughts as well. Um, some other uh, thoughts from others on what happens if we don't plan enough, and we will bring it together at the end and have some wrap up questions. And as I said, if we don't get to any questions within time, anything that we haven't already got on our FAQs on the website will be put up in due course. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Caroline. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so starting at the beginning I suppose really well you know what is planning all about why are we having this conversation and why are we producing our local plan um I mean planning is really you know at the heart of planning is around how we ensure sustainable development and that's a phrase that gets banded around a lot these days and you've probably all heard it in a variety of different uh contexts and I think many people understand that it's 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 about how we protect the environment in the long term so sustainable it's all about sustaining um, a healthy planet ultimately in, into the future for future generations. So clearly the environmental side of things is, is absolutely key, but the term sustainable development actually has three aspects to it. It's also about an economy because a successful economy provides us with all the products that we require to live on a day-to-day -day basis, doesn't it? As well as providing our work that sustains us as individuals, it also provides the goods and services that we need to live day-to-day. -day. And there's also a social and community aspect to sustainable development. So it's about how we, as uh, as people living on, on planet Earth, um, you know, how, how we live and interact and how we uh, how we make sure that um, we have an inclusive society that meets the needs of everybody. Um, and as I say, it's about today, but also for future generations. And there's been a lot in the news recently, hasn't there, um, about the climate change and so on. Um, I think it's also worth saying at the outset that we, in terms of our planning, the planning process and the planning system, uh, we have a plan-led system, and that means that the local plans and other development plans that uh, local planning authorities prepare 
um, set out the policies against which planning applications are ultimately judged. So it's really important that we engage effectively with our communities and all stakeholders um, in the plans we prepare because that plan will set the framework against which planning applications are ultimately judged. So it identifies how much development, it identifies where that development should go and the policies against which that development will be uh, proposed, proposed development will be judged. So this is the stage that's really important to, to engage because once the plan is set, it's the basis for determining planning applications. So, but, but also we don't start with a blank sheet. Um, as, as planners, as local planning authorities, we, we have to work within national planning guidance, which is set out in the National Planning Policy Framework, sometimes called the NPPF. Um, and the framework sets out very clearly for us what we're required to do as, as, as planners. And the local plan that we prepare, which is a development plan, it's a statutory plan. It's a plan that has legal weight in making decisions. So it's really important that that plan um, is soundly prepared and ultimately it gets tested um, at an examination by an independent inspector. So um, we have to make sure that we follow the required um, policies and requirements in setting out our plan because ultimately it needs to be found sound in order to be able to have weight and perform its job in providing that planning framework. Uh, and the framework says that we must provide for our objectively assessed needs for housing and other uses. And I think the word objectively assessed is, is, is important as well as it's our needs. So uh, what, does, what does that mean? And we'll come on to, to that. Um, this is also really important, unless any adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. Bit of a techie phrase, but what that basically means is, if meeting your needs, once you've identified them, would have significant harm, and that could be against all sorts of different considerations, but we've particularly identified the issue and challenge of water supply in this area, and we'll be picking that up in a future webinar. Um, but, you know, we're really clear that providing um, our needs is dependent on having sufficient water supply, because otherwise the significant impacts of doing so would be significant. So that's the sort of um, considerations we have to uh, weigh as we're preparing our plans. So the principles we need to follow set out in the framework are that we must determine the minimum number of homes needed um, and our policies must be informed by a local housing need assessment conducted using the standard method it's described as in national planning guidance. But that says, just to be really clear, sets a minimum number of homes uh, that, that, that are needed, but we also have to look at the framework as a whole and all the other aspects and requirements in, in the framework. So um, we have that standard method number as a starting point, but we also, the framework says, we must give significant weight on the need to support economic growth and productivity. And we know that the area here is, is an area that many companies want to locate, and we'll say a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and the framework also says that our planning policies and decisions should recognize and address the specific locational requirements of different sectors. Um, and that includes making provision for clusters and networks of knowledge driven. Uh, creative and high technology industries and I'm sure many of you appreciate that we are an area where we have a lot of high tech um, industries located here um, and it's worth thinking a bit more about well, why, why is that. So when we start to think about Greater Cambridge now in terms of jobs and homes we have a pretty unique economy here actually it's internationally significant um, in terms of the strengths in some key sectors. I mean, many of you will know that we have the Genome Campus, for example, we have the Cambridge Biomedical Campus, really important companies nationally and internationally here. So, you know, the companies that mapped out the, the, the genome um, 
companies that AstraZeneca, for example, on the biomedical campus, they're really important companies in, in this area come here because they cluster and they benefit from that um, location close to each other. And Greater Cambridge sits at the heart of three economic corridors. So the Ox Oxford Cambridge corridor is the one that's been talked about most recently, but also the corridor down to London that includes the Stansted area within it and also out to uh, Norwich as well. Um, and it's been identified that there's really been sustained long term growth in this area um, and the combined authorities recently commissioned independent economic review, sometimes called SPEAR for short, um, really identified the importance of the Greater Cambridge area in, um, in supporting economic growth, um, both locally but also nationally. So it's a really flourishing area and we have uh, but we need to make sure that we also have a mixed economy that includes a wide range of jobs. Um, you know, it's not just those high tech type jobs, it's also everything from uh, teachers, nurses, doctors, um, people who work in the shops, people that clean our shops and premises and, you know, the whole range of jobs um, to maintain the success of the area. Uh, while still also maintaining our area's global reputation for innovation. But some of that has come to the cost. So we know that there are really high house prices in this area. Um, we know that affordability is a real issue, both you know, for, for many of you and your families, and the councils take this really seriously in how we address that, that issue. And just fallen off the screen there, or my screen anyway, um, also impacts uh, around significant longer distance commuting. Um, uh, so if we don't provide enough homes in this area and people have to commute from elsewhere, that has impacts on house prices, but it also has impacts on climate change with, through carbon emissions. So a, a range of issues there that we need to bring together. And the way we've chose, we, we think we should approach that, the way we've approached that on the next slide, please, Paul, is to look at how we, how we look at the, the levels of growth that are important to provide for here. So, as I said, the government sets a, sta a method for calculating standard, uh, a standard method minimum. Uh, so we thought, OK, well, it's really important in an area of high economic growth to understand how many jobs that will support. And we've done that. And then we've looked to understand, well, depending on that level of jobs growth, and Stuart will take you through that in a, in, in a moment, but if the forecast jobs based on detailed evidence for our area is, is more than the number of homes that the standard method would provide, what does that mean we need to do? Because if we don't provide homes to go with those jobs, what are the implications? And I just talked about some of the problems that, that, that can be created with affordability and also um, travel and climate. So that's the approach we've taken to understand whether we need to provide for a higher level of um, housing provision alongside, uh, rather than the standard method, alongside the number of jobs we think are most likely to come to this area. So that's an introduction. I'm now going to hand over to Stuart, who will take you through in a little bit more detail um, about, well, what does that mean for jobs and homes? Thanks, Caroline. So taking really the, the higher that Caroline talked about uh, just now, which was starting with the forecast jobs based on evidence for Greater Cambridge, and then trying to understand if additional homes are required to support those. So that's what we're looking at here. So if we just think about the jobs to start with and to provide a bit of context, this is complicated. There's a lot of data involved. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, sectors involved and different factors influencing those. It is uncertain that the employment land and economic evidence base, which sets out this stuff in detail, acknowledges that it is challenging. Clearly, nobody knows the future. Um, and the, the uh, evidence base acknowledges the challenges of confirming both historic jobs and then trying to look ahead um, as well. Um, but the aim is to uh, look at all the available evidence to get the best understanding of what the future could be. And I would say that clearly 
as we've said before, um, it's necessary tasks that we've got in front of us, even if it is difficult. We've already said that we need to identify and provide for objectively assessed needs. The issues Caroline's flagged about housing affordability, for example, show the importance of understanding that relationship between homes and jobs. And there's also evidence such as the independent economic review that Caroline referred to showing that jobs growth has been higher than we thought might happen in the adopted plan. So we need to explore this in some detail. As I say, we've just looked at all the relevant data, uh, data to really get that best understanding. So to try and summarise the approach taken by uh, Matt and colleagues in the consultant team and trying to do that uh, at a fairly high level. So if we start by looking backwards, reviewing both the recent and longer term historic employment trends um, to get an understanding of what has happened in the past to give us uh, a basis for looking ahead. And then when we do look ahead, we start with uh, the standard regional economic forecast. Um, which has been used by many planning authorities uh, at other examinations uh, and is something that's necessary to use um, because it provides that view on sectors that then gives us an understanding of our employment land needs. So we use that as a starting point, but then looking at a range of evidence, including again at the past um, evidence of trends within key sectors, from talking to businesses and considering the, the uh, needs of those individual sectors. Um, uh, Matt and colleagues identified key sectors in Greater Cambridge that, we, that were uh, anticipated to grow above that baseline. Uh, and that I, looking at that in detail came out and identified research and development, professional services and health and care as the sectors um, that uh, the baseline uh, didn't appear to accommodate what might be reasonably anticipated to come forward. So the conclusions to that work really was uh, the, the main conclusion was a central scenario considered to be the most likely, and that accounts for a long term pattern of employment, including what's been seen recently. So there's been particularly fast growth since 2010, and that most likely scenario accounts for both that longer term and the shorter term. It did also identify a higher scenario, which is plausible um, and places greater weight on that more recent fast jobs growth. So that's the jobs. The areas of the homes, obviously the aim was to understand how many homes might be needed to support those jobs. Um, clearly there's a whole report which is called our housing and employment relationships report which sets this out in detail, but very, very roughly starting with jobs and moving to workplace population, the people working in those jobs. A key point is commuting patterns. Where are those people come from when they're traveling to work? You then get to resident population, resident households, and finally homes. And flagging that point about commuting patterns, we did explore that in detail. Um, I guess a default um, assumption would be that census 2011 patterns continue. Um, we also explored uh, an, a different assumption such that all the additional homes generated by the forecast jobs that we got on the left, above those supported by the standard method minimum homes, would be provided in full within Greater Cambridge. And we explored those two assumptions. And our conclusion was to identify a housing forecast associated with that most likely jobs forecast. And on the basis that we're seeking to minimize that longer distance commuting, we've uh, focused very much on the assumption that we would uh, provide all those additional homes needed to support the additional jobs above standard method within Greater Cambridge. So that's how we did it. If we just take a look at what the numbers are um, coming out of that. If you give me a slide, thank you. So again, just um, thinking about the homes to jobs and jobs to homes, minimum growth has st government standard method homes and then what jobs would that support? So the number of homes is uh, similar-ish to what we planned for last time, a bit higher, um, but that ends up as supporting slightly fewer jobs per year they're, in, they're in, in, in our adopted local plans. Um, and that in itself in terms of the jobs scenario um, is 12 or 13,000 jobs less than what our employment evidence shows as being the most likely. So that suggests that if we were to plan for our standard method homes, um, that would be likely to contribute to those uh, problems that we've seen of worsening housing affordability and further increased longer distance commuting 
because we would essentially be under providing homes to meet the jobs that we expect to come forward. So that central most likely scenario is for about 58,500 jobs uh, and that would uh, accounting for those providing all the additional homes above standard method um, in terms of the jobs provision would result in a figure of 44,400 4, 44, homes. You can see there's the highest scenario there too, and that's a significant number of jobs over and above what we see as the most likely. So 78,700 and a, a bigger number in homes again. We'd note that even that higher scenario isn't as high as what uh, was uh, suggested might come forward um, in the independent economic review. Um, even though you can see it's a very, very considerable number of homes and jobs. But as I say, we have identified that what we think the most likely scenario for jobs and the homes need to support that as being our objectively assessed need for jobs and homes. A key point just to end on really is that obviously these are uh, big figures, but we already have a big supply of jobs, uh, employment land and homes uh, committed in the adopted local plans. So that these numbers you see, you need to subtract that supply to get to the numbers that we uh, are planning for later in the in which Caroline will touch on later in the plan. So these are big numbers, but you need to subtract, subtract the commitments. These aren't all new homes needing to be found. I'll pass you back to Paul now for the interactive session. Stuart, thank you very much, and Caroline as well. It was really comprehensive. I just um, I just noted that um, a little bit of the tech on one of those slides there isn't showing on the bottom of the screen I think that we're just trying to fit so much information onto some of these slides that that's the problem the deck will be shared alongside the recording so we'll be able to pick that up anyway there um, and as and you know I suppose you know the, the you know the background of that is there is a lot of work in this and there's a lot of um, details so if people do want to explore further we'll give you the details obviously of where all of the publication of all of the evidence bases and all of the topic papers including the plan are so people can explore in greater detail uh, yes, and as, as, as Stuart um, has said, what we're going to try and do now is we're going to try and have a little bit of an interactive session, get you thinking, and um, break it up a bit slightly from us talking at you all of the time. Um, so we're going to use something called Mentimeter. Um, so we've used this once already before. It worked pretty well, um, and you should be able to see my screen now, which shows the Menti, um, the Menti logo and where you need to go. And what we'll do is we'll ask a question and get you to feed back some answers. Um, I've been told to leave this up for a little bit longer because last time people didn't have access to, to, the, to the slides so they couldn't log in. So you can do it one of two ways. You can um, just put your camera on that QR code and it will take you to the right place. I think you have to have uh, a, a certain type of smartphone that it should do it. If you have problems with that, alternatively, you go to www.menti.com and type in that code, which is 8,562, and it will take you to this Menti the actual code is at the top of all the slides. So when we move to the next slide, which I'm going to do uh, right now, it should be able, you should be able to see at the top of the screen the code. Um, and let me know if you can't do that and we'll just type it into the Q&A. So I'm going to ask you this question and, and, and you can you know, put as many answers in as you want for this, but it's just to get our minds thinking as well. Um, so do you, do you think, and bearing in mind this is the webinar topic today, do you think that it's important to plan for enough jobs and for enough homes? And if you do think so, why do you think that is? And I might come to the panel for some of their own thoughts on this, um, you know, as we're going, but I don't want to lead people. But if, if you start typing into the mentee, they should come up on the screen you can talk through them as they, as they come through. So, so let's come to you, Stephen. What do you think about planning for jobs and homes? What's your thoughts on this? You're already a very experienced planner. So, you know, you've worked in many, many different places and had lots of experience with this. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll try and be brief. And, and of course, if you don't think we should, I think it's also important that you say in the Menti um, script why, um, why you don't think we should. But, but, but fundamentally, obviously, uh, we have an obligation in many respects to try and properly match the infrastructure and the um, elements of the uh, of, that go with um, new homes and uh, and jobs, we have a, an obligation certainly as planners to properly plan for that, to try and plan for that, uh, and that includes not just um, those things that uh, are positive associated with it, but to try and manage the impacts uh, and some of the negative consequences that people have hi rightly highlighted uh, to date. 
Uh, and it's only by being honest about what uh, those issues are, both in terms of what we think is going to happen, uh, that in many ways we can we can approach that conversation um, with our eyes wide open uh, with with our communities. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, some of the thoughts that are coming through already, you know, highlight some of the you know the, the some of the um, detail that Stuart was giving. You know, homes, you know, and jobs come hand in hand together at the moment. You know, there are some questions around you know the future of working and what we've seen through COVID. But you know, at the moment we do you know we view them very much together. Um, and affordability is you know, another, another key one in terms of making sure that we plan for things in the right places. Um, I think an interesting one there is, is properly planned. And, and that's a really good point. And that's what we really are trying to do with this. I mean, in, in the UK, we are a plan led system. So, you know, a real focus should be on this part of the planning process, you know, ensuring that we get the right framework in place to outline at least you know where we are putting things and how much we think we might need and, and you know in, you know in terms of what Stuart's saying yes things are inherently uncertain but you know we still have a job to do to try and create some you know some buffer of certainty around it and is anyone others there that, that are standing out others on the panel that they want to pick up on I think it's interesting to see um, the leveling up point which I'm assuming almost goes with uh, the view that we should be taking a national view of these issues and so on. Well, clearly we do fit into a national picture. Um, there is regional planning going on, particularly the Ox Oxcam corridor level, which we'll have to respond to. But at the more local level, we, we are guided nationally to respond to the needs um, of the area through our planning process. So we do need to address what our needs locally are as well as um, responding to that national picture so there's a, there's a complex issue there yeah absolutely I mean one of the comments that's just come up that, that, that you know I'd like to touch on is enough for who and I think you know it's the broad range isn't it because as much as we are obviously you know planning for people who are part of our communities and residents here now you know that our plan goes to 2041 so you know we, we're planning for people who you know you know who are work who will be working that aren't who are in primary school now you know who aren't aren't even in school we'll be planning for schools that for people who aren't even born yet so it's really important to understand that you know although we don't know the answers we have to look at what we have known historically take that with trends and then you know and then really understand that and try and do our best but you know plans are a five-year process you know we do iterate this in five years and um, so it's really interesting to see some of those coming through so we will be capturing a lot of these comments as we go through it's part of our consultation to take these all into consideration but i think it's really nice to see some thoughtful answers coming through here and it's very much in the direction of travel of, of what we you know kind of think about when we're planning this stuff i'm gonna i'm gonna cut off the mentee now but thank you all for engaging we have got another one in, in a little while as well i'm gonna stop my screen share so we have got another one in a little while and i'm gonna also now we're gonna move back just a quick slide that I think that um, John's going to touch on and um, really on you know trying to explain what would happen from a planning perspective I suppose if we didn't you know if we didn't um, if we didn't plan for enough homes so John I'm going to hand over to you and hopefully we should have the slide deck back up again now. There we go. Um, well what are some of the consequences so in, in terms of the technical side of planning we've got technical requirements and expectations about what our plan needs to um, do in order to be sound. And in our first webinar on consultation and how the plan making process works, we talked a lot about soundness and what our plan needed to do to be able to be adopted. And one of those points was it needs to be properly prepared and have a strategy which uh, as a minimum seeks to respond um, to what's called the objectively assessed needs. Um, unless there are environmental issues which effectively prevent you from, from doing so. Some of the other consequences are that um, we are required to maintain an effective land supply across the area, and that's measured through something called the five-year land supply requirement. So each year we have to demonstrate what our requirement would be against our adopted plans, working at how many houses we're required to deliver over a five-year period and then demonstrating in quite a lot of detail 
about all the sites that will uh, be developed, all the houses that will be built in that period to demonstrate we've robustly provided uh, a housing land supply to, that will deliver those homes. So the consequences of not doing that are, in simple terms, we lose some control over how we plan in the district. So some of our policies will be given less weight. It may mean you get sites which aren't necessarily um, reflective of our adopted plan, for example. So it's very important we have an effective plan which demonstrates how we'll meet our needs, where and when it will happen, and how it'll be supported and so on. In all that detail, that's really one of the reasons why we do our plan making. But thinking about um, some other consequences if we don't plan effectively for our development needs, um, clearly it wouldn't allow us to have a forward-looking picture of what infrastructure was needed. Uh, so the transport, the schools, all the other things you'd expect to see coming along with developments, we need our plan to be in place so we can effectively plan with all our partners to make sure they're also being planned and timed uh, to be available when they're needed. Uh, we need to look at housing affordability, so we need to keep our supply of homes coming forward because everybody knows there are you know, significant price issues around the Cambridge area, and we need to make sure we're delivering homes to do our part in helping respond to those issues, and also delivering significant elements to be affordable housing. In terms of employment land supply, we're required to uh, maintain an effective supply of employment land. But if we don't do that, actually some of the firms that will be most affected are the lower value sectors and the lower value companies, which would struggle to find supply. And in sustainability terms, one of the biggest impacts would be uh, if the jobs keep happening, for example, and we don't plan for the homes, there'd be more and more commuting from a wider and wider area. And clearly one of our aims is to enable homes to come forward with jobs so people have the opportunity to access uh, either nearby jobs or access those jobs by you know, sustainable modes like walking, cycling, public transport, and so on. Um, and we need to consider our plan overall in sustainable terms in social, economic, and environmental issues. So it's all three parts of sustainability rather than just being you know, one environmental issue. We need to look at the whole aspects of sustainability. And um, we get asked a lot as well about what the impacts are of uh, COVID and Brexit, clearly the way of going, undertaking um, a lot of change happening nationally at the moment. Um, we know there are significant issues for the plan. The challenge is that a lot of the impacts of those issues are still becoming clear. A lot of the um, economic results are still being known. A lot of the forecasting impacts will still be looked at. So we know it's something we need to keep uh, in mind as we move forward, but the data isn't very complete yet. We don't really know what the full impact of COVID is going to be, for example. We have got some information, the slide goes on to talk about, that there has effectively been periods of lost growth, which we'll need, we'll need to look at as the data actually becomes uh, available. It's interesting, those issues actually vary a lot by uh, economic sector, and a lot of the sectors um, in the Cambridge area, so health, biotech and so on, actually been those ones that are most resilient, actually most needed uh, through this period. We also get asked a lot about what's happening regarding changing working patterns. And I think like everybody else, we, what we still need to understand what the picture is gonna be like when things do become more normal, but there is still high demand for workspace around the Cambridge area that, that's apparent at the moment. And then just finally, final slide from this section. Um, we also are aware of water supply issues that are important for the plan. And we've, we've put this slide in several of our presentations because it, it is an important issue. We know there are issues about the pressure on the chalk aquifer where a lot of our water comes from. Uh, there are planning processes in place by the water industry to look at how we can uh, get water more sustainably to deliver in the future. So for example, new reservoirs or connections up to other areas, but that planning process is still taking place. So we really need to know the outcome of that before we fully understand uh, how our plan can move forward. And we've been very clear on that in the consultation. And with that, I think I'll hand back to Paul for another interactive session. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. And that's helpful to have some context from our perspective as well. And yeah, we will run another interactive session now and, and hopefully um, you enjoyed the last one. I'm sure you're all absolutely excited about the next one I've got in store for you here.
Um, essentially, yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it, to talk about sustainability in the round, really, and, and, and the water issue, obviously, we know that that's, that's a, a huge concern, not just to our communities, but to us as well, because as planners, you know, we are trying to balance all of these things up. Um, if you are interested, as I say, we'll come to it at the end, there are a number of sessions that are going into more detail on some of these specifics. We've actually got a session tomorrow on the sites, but next week um, we have a whole session dedicated to climate change and, um, and the water issues are going to be discussed in, in far greater detail during that session. So I'm going to move to this next mentee. Um, again, same process, same code, I think, this time, which is quite good. I think we, 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 we're um, getting the hang of this now. So what we'd like you to do really just quickly is to rank these priorities or these five particular five priorities then in terms of when we're planning for new jobs and homes. Now, we've just thrown these five on here. You know, if you think there are other priorities that we should definitely be thinking of, then please put them into Q&A. We can stimulate some conversation within the Q&A with, within the Q&A with that. But, um, you know, as we've said, you know, don't just use the ones next to us. And you can see that our, our plan, our whole plan is built upon you know, the themes that we've kind of gone all the way through is around, you know, in, you know, inclusion and well-being, climate change, biodiversity in great places, but structured you know, with the underlying need and sustainable need to provide homes, jobs and the infrastructure that we are required to to support that. And um, so, yeah, you know, rank them. And, and, you know, as I say, you know, feel free to add some of your own thoughts into the Q&A about what you think might be might be priorities as well because there are also lots of other priorities within this you know within the plan that we're trying to tease out um, certainly and certainly and get your views on so housing affordability is coming up first here which um which is really interesting actually and 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 um, i welcome thoughts from the panel on this as, as as they're seeing some of these things come through because you know as in, in a way in some ways it's a little bit of a trick question because they're also interlinked um in the way that you know you, you can't have one without the other essentially and um, the housing affordability is definitely coming through. I don't know what I expected there, I suppose. I don't know what I expected people to say. I know there's only, only 40 or 50 of you on the group, but it'd be, be great to take this out. The whole of everybody in the whole of Greater Cambridge is so high up on the agenda. And, you know, you will note that actually a lot of our plan is based quite fundamentally on how we, you know, how we deliver the next 15 to 20 years and also, you know, move towards getting to a net zero, net zero target. Caroline, John, have you got any thoughts on, on that kind of, that ranking and what you think from a planning or plan making perspective, bearing in mind that you know, you have, you are fundamentally involved in producing the last adopted plans and how that's looking in terms of changes? So I think from my perspective, you try to pick up some of the, the broad issues. I'm noting in the Q&A, there's an awful lot of other issues uh, being raised, which I suspect we'll come on to in some of the discussion, if we haven't answered some of the points through the through the chat. Our big themes, uh, which have really guided the structure of the document, really do try and almost address, well, all of these through plan making. So, as you know, we've addressed very strong policies regarding uh, climate change. In terms of impact on natural resources, one of these issues on sustainability is we need to demonstrate that in meeting our needs, we have considered impacts on the environment. And you'll see we've prepared a significant evidence base looking at all the environmental issues that inform the plan and whether the development needs can be met in a sustainable manner. We've also done an awful lot of work looking not only at um, the overall jobs growth, very much uh, exploring what types of jobs we provide, including being informed by the study which Matt on this call um, uh, worked extensively on. And also we did add very clear theme on, on health and addressing uh, equality issues, which I think has been a real driver for the plan. It's actually difficult to rank these in some ways, and I think some of the impression we got through the responses to the consultation on the first consultation last year was that clearly everybody felt a lot of them were important and it was difficult to draw out one over another. I think one of the most overriding points though we had was climate change really did come out um, as a key driver. And that's not just setting or building standards, that is about how you meet development needs, where you plan those needs. And those really have driven how we've prepared this consultation. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think it's, it's interesting to see housing at the top and inequality and poverty at the bottom and, and you know, obviously intrinsically linked in that respect. So, OK, well, let's 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 move through the last slides, because then we can pick up some of those others in, in the Q&A now. And um, what I'll do is I'll, um, I'm going to go to Caroline, who's going to who's going to wrap up for us and bring start bringing bring it all together, I suppose. Um, Caroline, I'm just going to hand over to you. I just want to share my deck and see if we've got the slides up there. Um, yeah, thanks, Paul. Have them now. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just in just to bring it all all back together, then before we start um, answering some questions um, live. Um, so we've identified what we believe to be our need for new jobs and for new homes. Uh, we're still understanding needs for gypsy and traveler communities, COVID has held up that particular piece of evidence. So now we, we, we do believe that we have that, that clarity on, on our needs uh, and we have looked um, as to how we provide for those needs. So um, on the next slide, and I think, I think this comes to um, some of the issues that were coming out of the, uh, the, the, the interactive session just now, um, Paul, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, because I think we're starting to move into, into the strategy and where we provide for the homes and jobs. So uh, we're, we're going to try to stick to the numbers today, largely. Um, and we have a session tomorrow on, on the strategy and the site. So please do come back to that session if that's something that is particularly of interest to you. But it is important while we're talking about the numbers to recognise that we already have a significant amount of supply in our current plans and planning permissions. Um, so we, whilst those numbers are big, if looking at homes first, um, we already have over 37,000 homes in, in, in the pipeline. That goes a long way towards uh, that 44,000 plus uh, homes. Um, we we all, and, and that's in our current plans. Um, and we do think it's important to include a little bit of flexibility in our supply because things don't always go as you predict. Um, and therefore we also think it's important to include um, a, a buffer around about a 10% buffer. We think it's a reasonable buffer to include from, from previous experience. So that means when you take account of the supply that we have uh, we need to find sites for around another 11 and a half thousand more homes. And in terms of the strategy that we're starting to look to, which very much goes to that discussion around um, climate change being high up your list of um, important considerations, it's very much about where development goes that helps uh, address the climate impacts of development so that people don't have to rely on a car as the first port point of transport and so on so we're looking to make the best use of the sites we already have so um some assuming some faster delivery at north stone water beach a bit more development at eddington uh, and and new sites around the edge of cambridge so northeast cambridge cambridge east um in terms of housing and some job and, and camborne as a location for uh significant further growth um, and also from a business point of view down at the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. So I'm not going to touch in any more on that today, um, but that's a, a bit of a, an intro to tomorrow's session. So as I say, please do come back um, if you are interested in finding out and, and engaging more with us on, on, on that issue. Um, uh, and I, just to say, in terms of the questions, we will try to run through as many of them as we can. We haven't given you written answers to some of those because they're perhaps easier to talk through at, at, at this stage. Um, and then if we do, uh, don't get through, as Paul said, we'll provide some written responses to follow. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. And just as you know, appreciate that people aren't going to be able to make in person all of these sessions or virtually all of these sessions. So we are recording them all. Um, and we're promoting them out as soon as we've top and tailed kind of you know made sure that they're all ready to go they go live I think the one from last week is already live on the website this will go live as soon as we're ready to, to drop it and again tomorrow so if you don't if you can't make it or you know people who can't make it please do point them in the direction it's up on the um the uh website
website on you can see at the bottom there also if you're on twitter or, um, or any of the other social media platforms if you hashtag gc local plan it will bring up any of the social media that's going on around the local plan at the moment and you'll be able to see what's being uploaded and when it's being uploaded and um, so please do that as well and um, so yeah we've got another few events of these webinars coming up um but obviously there is a full events program we are going out on site as well as much as we can and um, so please do join us um so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to move over to actual questions we've still got quite a few so we'll move to the move to the panel um and i'm going to come and i haven't been able to see the questions so far so far so it's all going to be a big surprise to me picking them up now because i've had my screen on share so yeah um let's let's go through some of these um Right, let's have a go. And I won't mention names. You are able to post anonymously in here as well if you if you do wish to. Um, please go ahead. So, um, right, here's one. Why is there no effective limit on the number of jobs planned in the first proposals other than the market's ability to deliver from the large supply of land from economic development, which already exists, plus the new allocations proposed at North East Cambridge and elsewhere by 2040? Um, and if I understand that question right, maybe John, um, you could answer that one. Or Caroline, have you come off mute? Sure, I'm happy to start on that one if, if that's helpful. Sure. Um, so um, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, and I think employment operates in a slightly different way from housing. So this is an area that has been very successful in delivering um, economic growth or has delivered a lot of economic growth. I appreciate you may or may not think that's successful, um, but certainly has delivered a lot of growth um, and particularly in some sectors. But over a very long period of time, I've been working in this area for over 20 years now, and we've always uh, carried a very significant supply of employment land. And even when we've been, de been delivering jobs at a fast rate, we we've never used up all that supply at any point in time. So I think having that larger supply gives some flexibility in the area, it means it can flex with the different uh, economic cycles. Um, and it also means there's some flexibility in the location for development for different uses um, and, um, and, and their needs. Um, I think there's been comments in the, in the chat around the levelling up issue, and I think that's a really interesting one because um, whilst government has recently started talking about levelling up, we don't know quite what that means or quite how that might feed into policy, but there's still certainly very... Um, keen to see economic growth around the country. They're very keen to support economic growth in the Oxford Cambridge arc. Um, the combined authorities, independent economic review recognise the importance of Greater Cambridge, particularly in some of those um, key sectors of, of life sciences and so on. Um, so it's not the easiest question to to answer and there's a very long technical report that uh, Matt who's on the call here uh, and team authored um, uh, but what they look to do is to really try and understand our economy and our sectors and how they perform how they have been performing um, and make their uh, the, the, their best forecasts on what is most likely to happen over the next plan period and that also does look at what's happened over the recent past so um, you know, the, the, it, there's an element of it being kind of scientific, but there's also an element of there being a bit of an art in here as well. So, Matt, is there anything that you think would be helpful to add on, on that without getting into too much technicalities that might give people a bit more of an understanding around that issue? Uh, I mean, the sort of perhaps point to uh, consider is, is is right at the start that what, what um, officers are trying to achieve is a plan that will be found sound by the inspector when it goes through the full planning process. And obviously, there's lots of things to take into account, sustainability, kind of homes and jobs. Uh, the framework which the plan is measured against is the government's own framework. And the government don't uh, have a process for setting kind of utter, upper limit on jobs. But what they do expect is that objective evidence is prepared to uh, allow you know, whoever's examining the plan to feel that you know, a proper understanding has been made of the economy and the best planning as possible has been made to kind of to support and acknowledge that. So, I mean, I think we've, uh, as has been said, spent a lot of time trying to understand the economy, look at how it's performed in the past and, and how that might influence the future. 
Um, and then the, the plan as it's sort of moving forward is trying to you know, facilitate growth in, in a balanced way. Um, it, it, you know, it, there could be uh, <clears throat> ways in which they could be trying to push harder, but I, I, I think it's got this media idea of medium growth it, it is a balanced one. And it's one which ensures as the plan moves forward, you know, it, it, it tries to support growth without facing very much criticism that actually not enough has been done to support the economy, which would be the other end of uh, the challenge as, as that plan kind of gets through to uh, the examination process. So that there isn't a natural kind of upper limit on how to curtail growth, although uh, maximising the efficiency of land is obviously important. And a lot of North East Cambridge proposals do seek to, to do that in terms of brownfield uh, redevelopment and regeneration. Um, at the same time, Cambridge is unique in its national and international status as a place where some kinds of activities and research take place. Uh, and, and the plan is sort of trying to ensure that that can continue to happen, um, provide research, you know, and everything around the healthcare um, and, uh, you know, keep its kind of place and contribution to that national and international agenda. I'll just add to that one quickly, Paul. I'm also noting questions about land supply and specific references to figures. The other issue just to note is on our land supply that often our particular uh, land supply is unusual because it's made up of a number of large sites. So we end up with large numbers where sites will take uh, a number a number of years to come forward. And that's really reflected. So think about our new settlements, think about our uh, major employments, parks and so on. They mean you get large amounts of land supply which is carried forward and meets needs over a long period. And that's reflected in that supply. And another issue in the question was, well, do we effectively unallocate sites? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, there are sites uh, in the first proposals consultation, which we've uh, identified as not being um, proposed to carry forward into the new plan. Um, so we look at those sites each time we review a plan, to see if any allocations um, do warrant um, change. So you can find that again in our evidence base and also you can comment on those issues through the consultation. Thanks, John. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Caroline. Um, I'm going to move to a slightly different question now. Um, so how do the numbers relate to the aspirations of the Oxcam arc? So I'll start off with this one and then maybe Stephen, you might want to come in, in with some answers on this one. I mean, the Oxcam arc in itself is, is a not particularly well defined thing at the moment. I mean, we are part of it, but we are the local planning authorities and you know, we, it's, it's incumbent upon us to be planning for jobs and homes rather than, um, rather than government in that respect. Um, so there is a, I think there's a vision for the spatial framework for the Oxcam arc, which has just been out to consultation. I think it closed in October. With their plans, we don't know whether that's going to go forward and at what pace, but there were plans to bring a spatial framework forward over the next couple of years. Now, obviously, we work as closely as possible we can with um, kind of all of these interoperable you know, places and organisations and other strategic infrastructure that we have to assess when we're doing the planning. But um, Oxcam is something that we have to work with, um, but at the moment it's there's no firm it's not quite numbers. Um, so Stephen, do you want to add anything else? Can you hear me? Uh, Paul, I I'm, I'm not sure anybody could uh, make sense. I, I, I was, uh, I, I couldn't hear you fully, but um, yeah, well, really just to add to the point, um, the Oxcam arc and the spatial framework consultation su suggest that the uh, spatial framework will provide details of uh, housing uh, overall need uh, uh, across the arc and uh, potentially locations for growth. And we have sought clarity on what that translates to uh, on a kind of authority by authority basis. I think from our perspective, our approach to the Oxcam arc is uh, at a strategic level, it recognises the significance of places like Greater Cambridge uh, and the significance to the economy, to the country, uh, as well as uh, reflecting an ambition that the higher levels of environmental stewardship uh, and uh, performance are captured in future growth discussions. Um, in terms of numbers, uh, Chris Pincher has previously said that uh, 
uh, local authorities uh, will um, play a central role in um, uh, establishing uh, the housing uh, needs. Uh, and um, we are taking uh, that uh, at face value at this moment in time. We have a very substantial, and uh, uh, we've been talking about it this morning, uh, we think a very well thought through justification for the housing numbers that we've currently uh, put forward. But of course, we're seeking everybody, uh, including all of your views uh, on that. Uh, and we would expect quite robustly to reflect that back to government if they were to seek to do something different uh, through uh, what can only be a, uh, a much higher level and less um, uh, topic and uh, area specific basis. Thanks, Stephen. I, I apologise. I hope you can all still hear me. It was a momentary drop off. I'm, I'm usually pretty good at this time of the day. Um, okay, so another one here, paragraph 61 of MPPF, nice technical one for here, goes straight to paragraphs of, of MPPF, and says exceptional circumstances justify an alternative approach, which also reflect current and future demographic train, trends and market signals. So on what date, if I make that right, have the demographic train, trends been based? Now, I'm not sure we can answer that exactly, but I'm, I challenge any one of the panel to come back with an answer on that, that, um, that as such. Uh, um, I mean, I can uh, attempt to answer that. I mean, um, I mean the, the latest date possible, I think, is the answer to that. So the, the evidence uh, principally regarding sort of employment and demographics was published uh i think autumn 2020 uh and probably dates to the 2018 population pr projections um which was uh being used by cambridge econometrics at the time um and it may be the case that as the plan preparation moves forward there are further light touch updates to, to the evidence that that is issued um which was which keep that up to date so uh, I think it, it's incumbent uh, and the, the authority will, will continue to uh, use the latest data available and that's something that the inspector will, will be looking to uh, as they move forward. And that probably relates to some of those questions uh, on sort of Brexit and, and COVID that um, things are always changing uh, and all planning authorities will try and present them, them the latest information available uh, to them at that time. And that, that's only what, what can be reasonably expected Thank you, Matt. That's really helpful. Um, OK, is planning for jobs an option, for fewer jobs an option, i.e. limiting employment land available so that jobs are diverted to other areas? So levelling up, and I know you had a thought on this, Stephen, or John, probably. I think I think if I just go first and then perhaps John, John comments. Um, uh, it, it, I think there's the, the the role of the role of Greater Cambridge. I think we we need to recognise it is 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 not unique, but it's it's fairly um, uh, substantial in terms of the country's interests. Things like the life sciences industrial strategy, uh, and as Paul highlighted earlier, uh, I think in the comments, mean that our bits of the economy are are, are absolutely central to UK PLC's long term economic position. Um, uh, and, and COVID in many respects has only served to emphasise the significance of precision medicine and, and healthcare uh, in both uh, the security of the country, but actually also in, in, in addressing long term health and wellbeing issues. So um, there is an element to which uh, seeking to um, uh, limit the amount of, of, of space that we provide for those uh, for those important sectors does potentially uh, one of two things. And a number of people have said, um, if you limit the land available in, in Greater Cambridge for life sciences, for example, or some of the digital AI, um, those companies will just go to um, uh, other areas in the UK. Uh, and there's quite a strong argument that's made that that isn't necessarily what happens. Those, country, those companies um, uh, will go to other parts of Europe or indeed to other parts of parts of the world. So uh, unlike many parts of the country, we, we have uh, the unenviable position in, in which uh, we have a responsibility that goes well beyond the boundaries of Greater Cambridge and relates to the objectives, the very high level objectives of sustainable development for the country uh, to both um, capture and help mature um, 
these really significant and important sectors, not least for the for the area, but also thinking forwards in terms of the points that people have made about economic opportunity uh, and the importance of having um, those future roles uh, for young people today available locally uh, and and uh, and in Greater Cambridge and the UK, rather than necessarily seeing those um, opportunities disappear. So, so I think um, it. Conceivably, you could make it incredibly difficult, uh, or you could try to make it incredibly difficult for uh, jobs to continue to um, be created in this part of the world. Uh, you can expect very, very strong pushbacks from the UK government, uh, and indeed, um, substantial questions about further investment in infrastructure and the, and the justification for it, uh, recognising, for example, things like the very substantial city deal that Cambridge has, almost disproportionate. Um, in terms of its size relative to other city deals elsewhere, um, which reflect the government's importance given to places places like Greater Cambridge. I don't know if John wants to comment further. Just quickly before you do, John, I'm going to bring up the slide that shows how you can get involved in the consultation. We'll take another one or two questions while waiting. I know we're slightly over, but there's quite a lot still to go on and happy to run over for five minutes. But I'm going to bring up the slide so you can all... Um, essentially see how to access the consultation so you can put your detailed comments there and please do go to the consultation and um, there's a number of ways you can get involved with it and use a QR code or, or, or as go to the above. John, sorry. Uh, well, Stephen's given a very eloquent response, all I would say is in technical terms, if you look to the National Planning Policy Framework, which really sets out how we should be providing a sound plan, it would be about demonstrating that there's issues and the strategy we've come up with are sound, we've responded to needs and responded to the environmental, social, economic issues of the area. So any case you make uh, would have to be based around that. Clearly, uh, in putting out the consultation, we think we have addressed or explored environmental, social and economic issues and come up with the right strategy for the area. And now it's for people to comment on that before we draft the plan. So we very much want to hear whether we got it right, whether we got it wrong, what do you think we should do instead? That's a real key part of this process. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, I'm just going to pick up because there's a couple of questions around kind of homes, um, work changes in working practices around COVID. I mean, we discussed it before and, and John did bring it up in the slide deck. I mean, we are aware that people have changed, you know, slightly how they're working and, you know, we're all remote working at the moment i think it's it's important to you know understand that actually a lot of modeling has to be a little bit more long term and that we don't know what trends will move forward or what will hold and what won't but we are certainly and we will be doing some further economic work over the next year the next part of plan making but you know it's important to remember that local plans are also iterative processes you know you know this is our plan for the next this will be our plan for the next you know 20 years but we will be reviewing that on a regular basis at minimum five so you know we will be able to review those those you know those policies as we go forward and you know i think we are all working in an area where things have happened that have accelerated kind of the way that we work and live in the last year and a half and you know we have to be cognizant of that but we also have to be cognizant that trends develop over time and we need to look at look at that time you know proportionately to plan effectively um okay i'm going to go to one more question now let's just spin down to one that seems to be um I've been around there. all right let me have a look because i can see a few have been answered uh, please explain the calculation for medium plus target for growth i think that probably might be caroline to explain that are you happy to do that caroline or matt uh i'm happy to talk to that one Paul. Um, so medium plus is, is essentially the, um, the medium growth level in terms of jobs um, and providing um, all the homes associated with that uplift in jobs above those supported by the standard method. We've tried a number of different ways of trying to explain this quite tricky uh, issue but if you remember back to that picture with the houses and the briefcases number of jobs that are supported by the standard method how many more jobs do we think we're going to provide in our area and how many 
more homes do we need to provide to uh, deal with those additional jobs? The medium plus means that all those additional homes are we're proposing would be provided in our area rather than um, require people to travel from outside. Thank you very much, Caroline. That's a, yeah, it's a it's a difficult thing to explain. OK, everybody, well, we're five minutes over, so I'm going to stop there. As I say, the web the recordings, um, the recording is, is going to be will be live probably by the end of the week. We've managed to get through you know, a huge number of questions, but you know, out of the eight remaining, we will get those that haven't been answered in some form already that are already on, answered on our website. We'll get them into FAQs. I'd like to thank you all very, very much for coming along and then joining in and engaging today. It's been a pleasure to have you. I really like to thank all of the panel and you know thank you for all of your thoughts and adding to the content Matt especially as um, you're not part of our direct team so thank you for coming along and um, as I say please get involved um, it's really important that you know you communicate your views on this stuff and um, you'll see on the website follow the hashtag um, and keep coming along to the sessions we'll be running them throughout the month um, but otherwise I wish you all a fantastic afternoon and a fantastic week and um, I look forward to seeing you in the next session tomorrow.